Good morning, it's Reverend Mike Capert from the First Presbyterian Church of Elmwood Park. I'm about to read from John 18 and 19. This is the same biblical text I read from a couple of weeks ago with a very different sermon. Don't do this very often, but I don't want you to think you've accidentally looking at a rerun. This is a brand new sermon for a, a very important text. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it that you've done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king? In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of the truth listens to me. What is truth? retorted Pilate. With this he went out again to the Jews, gathered there, and said, I find no basis for a charge against him but it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, no, not him. Give us Barabbas. Barabbas had taken place in an uprising, taken part in an uprising. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They hailed him. Uh, King of the Jews, as they, after clothing him in a purple robe, and they slapped him on the face. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here's the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! Answered, you take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, we have a law, and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? He asked Jesus, but Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said, don't you realize I have the power to either free you or to crucify you. Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jewish leaders kept shouting, if you let this man go, you are no friend to Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. This ends our reading. I'm going to begin the sermon with a little imagined monologue from Pontius Pilate. I feel trapped today. That's ironic, isn't it? Here I am, the Roman governor of Judea, the mighty Pontius Pilate, with supreme authority in this province, and I feel trapped. Why the army did this, you ask? What incredible power was there in this backwater to threaten the representative of Rome? I'm embarrassed to answer. It was a peasant from Galilee, a carpenter turned preacher. I guess he's a popular figure, but I have it. I find I have a hard time keeping track of these Hebrew prophets and preachers and would-be messiahs. They come and go like a, that fly you keep trying to shoo away, shoo away and it comes back. Those officious temple priests brought him to me, Caiaphas and his lot. They wanted him to be executed, told me he claimed to be the king of the Jews. So I questioned him. He's an odd one, this Jesus. Here I am with the power of life and death over him, and he would barely speak to me. And when he did, he was impudent beyond belief. For example, when I jokingly asked him if he was king of the Jews, he wanted to know if that was my idea or not, as if I would pay some attention to some Jewish pretender. 
Then he said he had a kingdom, but that his kingdom was of another place. First, I thought he was claiming to be a king in exile. But then he started talking about truth, being on the side of truth and other such drivel. So I concluded that he was a lunatic, a kind of deluded dreamer who was not worthy of death. I offered to release him. I gave the crowd a choice between Jesus, whom I proclaimed to be innocent, and this revolutionary fellow Barabbas, who was clearly guilty. And they chose Barabbas. Unbelievable. Well, I really didn't want to kill this Jesus. I thought maybe they would be appeased if I just had him whipped. That's, uh, what I didn't know is that my guards would decide to have some sport with him. They made a crown of thorns and pressed it into his flesh. They put a robe on him and mocked him as the king. So when I, I sent for him to show him to the people, he came out with his robe and his mock crown. It was the strangest thing. I don't know how it's possible for somebody to look pathetic and regal at the same time. But this Jesus was. I felt sorry for him, but I also felt his presence, the force of his personality. Ironically, he really did have a kingly quality about him. So I determined that I wanted to, to save him. I offered just to release him. I was going to let him go. I really was. But they just kept shouting, crucify, crucify, crucify. I was afraid there'd be a riot. So I brought him in and spoke with him again. He said something that sounded crazy, but it chilled me to the bone. There he was, beaten with blood on his face from the thorns. And he said, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. I tell you, there was a force, a power about the man. I just knew that he was guilty of any evil. There was nothing guilty about him at all. I've ordered many people crucified. Some have deserved it more than others, but this man did not deserve it at all. But he was the one they shouted for me to crucify. People, every time I looked at him, I saw all the others that I've condemned to die. I wanted to save him, I really did. But it's my job to keep the peace. My position would be jeopardized. My future career endangered. The mob might have overwhelmed the guards. Who knows? I had a choice to make. I could give myself up for the sake of this Jesus, or I could give up this Jesus for the sake of number one. I felt trapped between Jesus and the crowd. Man, it's choking with tension pulled in two directions. I just had to resolve it. I tried and tried to maintain myself as I am, to keep all my personal ambitions and goals, and also to maintain this Jesus as he stood there in his dignity and his goodness. But there was no way to do both. I had to make a choice, and I did. I think he was the best man I ever met. But I chose to save my own life and kill him. It's funny, but I can't help but thinking he would have done just the opposite. If our positions were reversed, he would have given his life to save mine. <laughs> crazy thought, right? It's crazy. The whole thing. What a crazy day. End of monologue. Today we speak of what is probably the most important great end of the church or goal of the church. The exhibition of the kingdom of heaven. To the world. Now, the center word in that phrase is kingdom. And the simple truth is this if you're going to be part of a kingdom, you need to serve a king. You need to choose between making Jesus your king and making the things of this world your king. Picture yourself standing in the crowd as Pilate offers you a choice between Jesus and Barabbas. In this analogy, Barabbas represents the world. So, who will you choose? There stands Jesus. He is calm, but determined, confident, and serene. Next to him is Barabbas. He is full of nervous energy. He rattles his chains and curses his captors. Who will you choose for your king? 
Barabbas has a lot of scars. You know that he's been in many fights. He's a cagey fighter, wiry and tricky. Jesus, the Prince of Peace, is no wimp either. He has a carpenter's strong arms and hands, steady and sure. He has made things of use and beauty, but he never hurts people. Which one do you trust is the ruler of your life? Barabbas promises that if you follow him, he will make you a first-rate bandit. You can raid and loot and get rich. You can trample others underfoot and push them around. Jesus promises that if you follow him, he'll stick with you through thick and thin. Following Jesus, you can get through anything. No worry, no hardship, no sorrow will ever get the better of you. Which of these do you want watching your back? Barabbas can barely contain his explosive anger, but today he's terrified of dying. In fact, really, he's, he's both furious and fearful most of the time. Jesus is sometimes sad, but never afraid. Most of the time, he's happy and joyful. He laughs easily. He smiles as he invites you to join him. Which will you accept as your king? Some people think they don't have to make a choice. That's what Pilate thought. But he was wrong. Pilate thought he could serve the world, but still respect Jesus. He asked about truth, but didn't really care about the answer. He considered Jesus innocent, but crucified him to appease the crowd anyway. He wrote King of the Jews on the sign above the cross, but did not bow down to Jesus as king. He thought he didn't have to make a choice, but he made one all right. He chose the world. Anyone who does not choose Jesus chooses the world by default. I think that those are the saddest cases of all. How sad it is that given the greatest opportunity in the world, chance to worship Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, how sad it is that some people kind of shrug, nod respectfully in Jesus' direction, and then get distracted and wander off somewhere else. How sad it is that some let the most important decision of their lives be made through inaction and by default. How sad it is that some people try to sit on the fence their whole lives, sort of liking Jesus, but never following him. Whom will you choose this day? That is the question which determines which kingdom you are in, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of this world. I hope you will choose the kingdom of heaven. And having chosen it, I hope that you will live deeply into it, adopting the qualities that Jesus showed and becoming more and more Christ-like during all the years that you live in that kingdom. And as you shine brighter and brighter as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, I hope that you will exhibit its qualities to the world, that you will testify to its goodness and demonstrate its love and kindness in the ways you treat your fellows. Be like the lamp held high or the city on a hill. Let the light of Christ shine through you as you live kingdom lives. Be like tiny seeds that grow and bring shelter to many lost little ones that fly this way and that, blown about by the winds of the world. Be like yeast. Yeast? It's small and gets dumped in with the messy flour and the milk and things. What kind of image is yeast for the kingdom of heaven? Really a crucial one. Because citizens of the kingdom of heaven uh, do not withdraw from life. They don't just hide in the church, avoiding the world. Rather, they are worked into the world. And they have this chemical effect making it rise, changing the world, multiplying and bringing others into the kingdom. It's a great image. I love these great ends of the church, but I wish I could change one word about this one. When we say that we exhibit the kingdom of heaven to the world, that makes it sound like we're on a stage putting on a show. And that's true. People do look at the church when they're wondering whether to become Christians or not. But I would rather use the word do. Do the kingdom of heaven in the world. 
Let your citizenship in Christ's kingdom be who you are as you work your way into the messy dough of this world. Let the ferment of the gospel so permeate your life that it affects everyone around you, raising others up and bringing them into the kingdom. Do the kingdom of heaven in the world and make Christ your king proud of you. Goodbye, my friends. Amen.